Hey everybody, Chris here, and today I come to you with a pretty special video that I've been talking about for quite a while on my uh, social media and here on YouTube, and I finally got around recording it. What I'm going to do is present to you uh, my session for the piece uh, The Rain Formerly Known as Purple from the Risk of Rain 2 soundtrack. And I'm gonna do a kind of in-depth overview of my uh, session for it. And because this is going to probably take too long, I'm not gonna waste any time at all. Let's jump straight into the session. So, this is my Cubase session for the piece. Cubase, it's a digital audio workstation where I do my recording and mixing and my whole production using mostly virtual instruments and plugins, but sometimes I will record uh, hardware stuff like my guitar or my Eurorack. From the top, we have my utility tracks. This is a, a ruler track, which just tells me how long the piece is, because the main uh, global ruler here is usually set on uh, bars, so I know how at which bar I'm, I am. It gives me a musical reference of things, but I also want to know, you know, roughly how long the piece I'm working on is at any given moment, so now I know that this one is uh, almost eight minutes long. Then I have my markers track. Currently two region markers exist and one is named OST and the other one is named in-game. And these are the ones that I'm using to select the region that I want to export. And uh, if I actually zoom in here, you will see that the OST version has a little bit of a pre-roll. There's a little bit of silence just for the, for the album. When the in-game version starts exactly on the beat and uh, finishes on the beat, as you can see here. And that's because uh, I want to have a perfect loop in game. Now, let me just quickly expand this area over here. This is a feature of Cubase in which you can separate your um, session in two uh, distinct areas and have uh, either areas populated with different tracks and the reason why this is helpful is for example some tracks I want to have constantly available to me like the markers and the ruler because you see that when I uh, scroll down in the bottom half of the session which is the main half these just stay up there viewable they're not scrolled away another way I'm using this is to actually hide away stuff that I don't need to see what I've hidden away here is my tempo track because it's not relevant uh, since this piece is fixed on uh, 130. It doesn't change at any point. And the same goes for my time signature. It's constantly 4-4 throughout, so I don't need to uh, take a look at that at any time. A couple of tracks that I've hidden away and actually disabled here is uh, this track called The Beacon. This is a track that exists on all uh, Risk of Rain tracks that are playing during the main level, so before the teleporter is activated. This is an arpeggiated sound, semi-random, but the notes that it will arpeggiate to are following the harmony of the main piece, and the timing of the arpeggiation is kind of random, to make it feel like a random signal. Once I have the entire piece completed, I will record the output of this channel, and this will be dropped in the game playing parallel with the music, but it's not part of the music per se, it's a sound that we've positioned within the game on the teleporter, so it's as if, if the teleporter is emitting the sound to guide you towards where the teleporter is. And within the game it is lowered down in volume the further away you are and also has a little bit of reverb to it, and the closer you get to the teleporter the, the sound becomes more obvious. Okay, so once recorded, it's just uh, tucked away here and uh, disabled and I don't have to look at it again. It doesn't have to take any resources, I don't need to mute it or anything, it's just away. And another thing that exists here, this is just uh, reference audio because in within this track, if you're not familiar with that piece, it has a few uh, musical references to Prince's track. And I had these just so I can, you know, quickly go back and forth and see what's going on in the original piece and see how I can interpret ideas and motives and stuff into my own. Now, let me do a quick overview of what we're looking at here. I'm gonna actually uh, zoom a little bit tighter here. You obviously see a couple of things. One is that things are color-coded, so 
My drums are red, bass is this kind of orange yellow thing. My synths, my pads, my keys. My body, my pad, my ride, my family, my church, my boy, my girl. My, my leads, my guitars. Sorry. And the second thing is that things are uh, in folders so that they can be tucked away and I can focus on uh, the thing that I want so that other stuff are not distracting me essentially. So one note about the color coding and the placement of stuff. Because of my orchestral training, I'm used to seeing things in a standard way. Uh, in the orchestra, when you're looking at a score, you're always looking at, uh, f let's take the four main uh, families of the orchestra. So you're always looking at woodwinds, brass, percussion, and strings. These four always go from top to bottom, and within them there's even further uh, structure, so to speak. So it's always, you know, like flutes, oboes, clarinets, and bassoons, for example, in the uh, woodwinds. And it's easier for me to always have a kind of similar structure in my electronic slash rock hybrid session. So what I do is that I always have things in the same order. So it's always drums, bass, synths, pads, keys, leads, guitars, miscellaneous stuff, my sends, my buses, my body, my pay, my ride, my fame, my trip, my... and my outputs. Uh, I have found that this system mostly works for almost everything that I'm doing. I obviously stray away from it if needed, but uh, for most of the time it sort of works because it covers pretty much everything and the same thing goes not 100% but mostly for the colors, especially when it comes to drums and basses. My drums are always red and my basses are always oranges, maybe yellow, depending on how many of them and stuff. Okay, one last thing before we jump into dissecting the music. Uh, I wanted to talk about my sends and my buses here. Now, there are two ways you can apply an effect. You can either use an insert, which is a, an effect that interrupts your signal flow. It goes directly on the signal, for example, a compressor or an equalizer or what have you, or distortion unit. And the other way is to take your original signal and then send a copy of it to have a different processing on it. And this usually applies to reverbs and delays, but it can also be used in any way you want. There's no uh, limitations there. So you send that copy, you apply the reverb on it, and then you blend those in the mixer, either by adjusting how much of your signal is going to be sent away. For example, here I'm sending this track at minus 20 dB on my main reverb and uh, roughly minus 20 on my main delay, but you can also just adjust the actual mixing of that reverb and that delay within your uh, entire mix. So. What I usually do in my session, I have a few global scents. One of those will be a main reverb and the main delay, and I call these the space-time effects uh, because they um, kind of define the space of the recording. So I might send a lot of my stuff there. Then each and every one of these tracks is sent accordingly to one of the buses here. So you can see that I have a few buses set up here. You can see they are separated by uh, families, so drums, acoustic, drums, electric, bass, synths 1, synths 2 and pads, synths 3 and keys. And by the way, the distinction is usually that my synths 1 are what I call motion synths, so more of attack and patterny stuff, like arpeggiated stuff or motives that are kind of repeating. Since 2 are all the open and atmospheric stuff and since 3 is where I will put everything that is a keyboard thing. For example, in this session I have my organ my body, my rife, my trunk, my organ and my piano. Then I have my leads and I have my guitars 1 and 2. These will be grouped perhaps acoustic and electric or rhythmic and lead guitars, stuff like that, depending on the session and then miscellaneous one, miscellaneous two, and finally a bus where my main reverb and delay will be grouped so I can uh, adjust all of them with one fader or export them separately for my stems 
The reason why I organize these on buses and I don't send them directly into the mix bus is that I might either want to do big movements, for example, take all my drums down for uh, for a little bit or do a, a fade so I don't need to do an individual fade on all of the tracks, I can just do it here on my bus. And also sometimes I will have a nice compressor on the buses as a group, as a whole, to, to treat them. Or I might even use sends on these buses. So I might take the entire, you know, synthesizer group and send it away to a river for whatever reason. It is also sometimes helpful to have uh, sidechain stuff going on. So I might want all my synthesizers to be sidechained by the kick drum, for example. So it's much easier to do it here on a bus than do it individually on each of the synths. So then all my buses, their output is set to go on the sub mix. Now, here is where my uh, mixing chain takes place. So this is kind of my final processing of the overall piece. Then this is sent, it says two targets here. The one of the targets is the master bus which is right here, and the other one is the mix bus. I'll quickly go to the mix bus. As you can see, the mix bus literally has no processing on it. It just takes what comes from the sub mix and exports it. But it also goes to my master bus where two things happen. First of all, what my speakers play is what's going on here. Here is a limiter, which has two functions. One is to boost things up, because when you're mixing, you're usually kind of tamed down a little bit. But here I'm boosting things up, so when I listen to them, I listen to them at a master level. And the other thing is that by having this here, I can actually export something that will be used either as a reference for my clients, so that they don't have to, you know, turn the volume up on their stereo or their uh, phone or whatever. And also it's kind of a ready master, because essentially when I'm out of my mix bus, what comes out of here is pretty okay production wise so by just adding this much of a boost i bring it up to uh nominal levels to be used for example in the game and for that exact same reason there's a dithering plugin applied because i'm going to uh, bring down my bitrate from 32 bit float to 24 bits of uh a high resolution master or maybe even 16 bit if i'm uh, exporting for some other reason anyway uh, let's talk about the actual music. So, folder one, the drums. I'm gonna press my shortcut here to expand my session a little bit. And I'm gonna open up the section here below so that we can take a look at MIDI stuff when we select it. So, first channel, drums acoustic. It says kick drum, but that's kind of a false thing because it's actually the first channel of a multi-track uh, VST. Right here, it's my BFD3. It's my favorite plugin when it comes to acoustic drums. And I have Captain Trips is my acoustic drum template. It's not used almost at all for this particular piece. It's only used here at the end, playing during the outro, playing the cymbals. So you can hear, and I'll put my headphones so I can hear too. That's all that's going on in this particular piece. Now, there's nothing particularly fancy going on here except one little detail that I wanted to, to show you and that's this right symbol here. If you see right here on the, sorry, on the model settings, take a listen at the pitch of the symbol when it's played. So you're hearing that the loudest it's being hit the pitch slightly comes up, and that's by adjusting this setting here. Uh, if I take this down to zero and replay the thing, then the symbol does a normal, let's say, uh, behavior, which is not changing its pitch. I'm gonna exaggerate it now so you can hear it again. So this is just a little fine detail that I've used to add a little bit of flavor to the hits here, if you listen to it with the whole thing. Now it wouldn't be 
strictly impossible for a symbol to do this, to change its pitch a little bit, depending on how you strike, because it might uh, excite different harmonics, but not to that extent. But still, I'm kind of uh, using it because I think it's a cool effect. Just a little touch there. Now, we're, that's all that the acoustic drums are doing. We don't need to bother any further. Let's move on to our main kit here. And I'll expand here so that you can see that these are, it's a, again a multi track and it has all of these here. The benefit of having it in a multi track is that I can process things separately. So, this is the drum machine that I'm using. Let's listen to it a little bit. If you're, if any of you are, are familiar with how this looks, this is an emulation of the Lindrum. It's an old drum machine that was very popular from its inception and throughout the 80s. A lot of artists use it, every major studio had it. It has a very distinct sound. The reason I'm choosing this particular drum machine, which is by the way not used in any other piece of the soundtrack, is that Prince liked to use this drum machine a lot, so I'm kind of doing a, an audio reference to Prince by utilizing this particular sound. And let's listen to it a little bit. So let's take a look at the MIDI here. Actually, just hide away the... So take a listen at what's here. Actually, let me just do this so you can better see all the notes more clearly. Take a look at what's going on here and what you're hearing, what you're listening, right? And see if you can spot any discrepancies. Let's include the second bar. Let's mute these. So, if you haven't noticed it, what's actually different is that the hi-hat, this is the hi-hat. You can even listen while I'm selecting it. I'm selecting it and you hear two clicks. It's written every quarter note, but you're actually listening eighth notes so it's a, instead of being ta 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 as it's written ta 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 you're actually listening ta ka ta ka ta ka ta ka ta ka right so how this has happened is that in the hi hat here i'm using an insert which is this uh delay effect and to hear the difference i'm going to turn it off And notice two things that will happen when I turn it on again. The one is, as we talked about before, that we're gonna hear the offbeat. The ta, 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 ta. This is because of the repetition of the effect. The other thing, especially if you're wearing headphones or listening on a, a, a good speaker setup, you will hear that the mix will go wide, of the, the sound of the drums will go wide. Listen. Can you hear that the hi-hat is like at the edges of the mix? So this is what this effect does. Let me actually play the whole mix. I'll turn it off. And then I'll turn it on. You see how wide the mix is now? Just because I've added stuff at the far edges of the mix, it suddenly becomes wide. Now, that's a thing that stands for uh, production, both in the uh, panorama of the thing, so from the, the wideness of the mix, but also in the height of the mix when we talk about frequency. Even if my entire mix is pretty centered, everything is quite focused, it's not a particularly wide mix overall still just adding a few elements for example the hi-hat here being on the far left and right of the mix it really gives uh, the sensation that we're listening to a wide mix the same goes 
for frequency spectrum even if your mix has a lot of low end low mids adding just a few elements that stand out that sparkle if that's a hi-hat if that's i don't know a tambourine whatever it will still give the illusion that you have uh, a nice bright mix so you can take advantage of that so another thing that might be worth noting is that you can see it especially here where my uh snare drum and claps exist that they are not entirely quantized and if you take a look at the notes they are not on the grid this is because i played this on my keyboard and i quantized it just roughly and i left it open so that it's uh it has kind of a more human feel so that's the main drum kit let's move on to the next one which is this uh, drum kits from Native Instruments, the battery, battery 4 in particular. Here I'm loading a kit that I made back in uh, Risk of Rain 1 and I've used it a lot. This final vinyl kit I've used it for Risk of Rain 1. And the reason I'm using this kit again is because it comes from Chanson de Tom, which is a piece that is heavily referenced within this piece. So let's hear what this drum kit is playing. Let's take it here because uh, it's a bit more involved. So here it's doing this. So kick drum and this kind of shakery sound. Let's hear it together. Uh, I'll bring in the, the main drum kit. So you can see that I'm boosting the uh, drum kit significantly with a more rounded, more uh, 808-ish sound. And also the shaker adds a little bit of crunch to the very clean sound that the, the lean drum is, uh, is doing. So that's pretty much it about that. And then finally, we have the actual sample from Chanson de Tom, uh, which is really heavily manipulated here. I brought this in. And then I did a lot of processing and then I kind of did a new export of it and I'm using it right like that. So what's going on here? Let me just uh, loop this little section. Very soft. And this very trademarkish snare uh, from Sanchon de Ton. Let's expand the loop and bring stuff in. So hear how the little tickets go in between and then I'll take away the, the this little sample and as soft as it may be, you will hear that it does make a difference. So I'll take it away and bring it up in. So you can see that there's a little, it adds a little bit of movement to the drums because of the all intermediate uh, hits in between of the other stuff. So listen to it again. And it also adds a little bit of crunch and a little bit of brightness to the, to the whole thing. So these are the drums. Oh, I should say there's uh, just a little bit of a shaker sample here. Uh, nothing fancy. It's also brought from... Uh, Chanson de Tom. Oh, and the sample here is used uh, in a more prominent way, the, dr the drum sample in, in the break in the middle. Uh, it's heavily filtered using this uh, plugin here from Arturia. Speaking of this plugin, if you notice the dry and wet knob, you will see that when I'm here, it's all the way on, on dry. So I'll show you the automation and here is the automation for the dry wet knob. So you can see how this will enter in play during the passage to the break. So you, you hear how this uh, filter really adds a lot of crunch to the sound. It, it's, it has a beautiful 
a distorted sound when you you really have I've pushed the resonance quite a bit and my frequency is about uh, 850 hertz so cutting out a few of the highs and really boosting the resonance so it drives the filter and also if you're if you're hearing the frequency of the filter going up and down that's because there's an LFO applied to it so it, it kind of fluctuates a little bit anyway these are all details uh, but still might be you know interesting to some people here and then I have my reverb which is a plate emulation again for Arturia it has a very nice sound this is applied to the drums and if you see here particularly it's applied to the snare the hi-hat and the clap so these are the drums from the Lindrum that I'm uh, adding a little bit of reverb to them finally you see here that I have a copy of this plate that, and the track says no fade this you don't need to worry about this too much it's just for handling the transition to the outro I'll talk about it a bit later it's not that important so then we go to the bass the bass is made using Native Instruments FM8 synthesizer this is a frequency modulation synthesizer the most common way of synthesis is a subtractive synthesis where you have a complex waveform like a square or a triangle and this this is very rich in harmonics and then you use a filter to kind of filter out harmonics or boost them with the, using the resonance and create a, a new sound in fm synthesis essentially you again utilize these fundamental forms the, the sine wave the triangle what have you or or variations of those but then you kind of cross feed them into each other it's it's not very easy to explain but essentially if you take a look at the matrix right here stare at it stay S stay okay now you understand the FM synthesis completely and you don't need to know anything else about it now one thing that FM synthesis does very nicely is do great basses so I'm using uh, this synthesizer to make my bass here. There's a little bit of distortion applied. I'll take it out. You see how subtle it is? It's, it's quite subtle, it's not a harsh, it's not a distortion effect, it's just a little bit of drive, a little bit of crunch. The, the line that is played is very simple, let's see here, just follows the harmony. And that's it for the bass. There's really nothing extravagant going on. It's really just a basic bass. Okay, so let's tuck these away and open our synths. I know a lot of people call this the remix of Chanchon de Tom. Other people call it a remix of Purple Rain. The reality is that this piece is neither of those. It has nothing to do with being a remix of any of those pieces. It does reference both pieces, but this uh, synth line here is how this piece originated. All the other stuff were introduced later on to invoke this being a quasi sequel to Sanson de Tom and to, to invoke the idea of paying a homage to, to Prince. Uh, but this is how things actually started. This is Twin, it's a synthesizer from FabFilter. Now this synthesizer is a quite powerful beast. It's a subtractive synth, essentially, kind of modular subtractive synth. You select your basic waveform. It has three oscillators. They go into the filter. You apply your um, envelope to shape the sound. You can also add a bit of delay within the synth. You can do a lot of modulation and uh, you can send stuff pretty much everywhere. It has a lot of cross modulation things going on and I'm using it to play this sound. 
which, you know, it is what it is, but it works. So this is kind of like the, the, the core of the piece together with the Chanchon de Tom sample that we have here. Let's play them together for just a little bit. I'll talk about this sample in a minute, but, um, well, not, not literally in a minute. It's going to be a while, actually, before I talk about this sample. But anyway, that's the bulk of the piece, essentially, plays almost throughout. And so this main synth is then doubled by the modular V, which is an offering from Arturia. It's an emulation of the Moog modular. If this looks daunting, it's because it is. It's quite nerve-wracking to, to wrap your heads around it, but once you're kind of familiar with... Uh, modular synthesis and patching stuff and how things are supposed to go or not supposed to go to make sounds, you, you can get really interesting results from that. An all around nice, round, safe sound. I really, really like this pairing. Anyway, this also pretty much plays throughout. Now, one last thing that you're seeing here is this beacon. It just plays here. And in fact, if I expand the automation on it, you will see that this is a volume automation curve. You will see that it doesn't even play in this part. I decided to completely remove it. It only kicks in in the second half of the break. So... You hear how subtle it is? It's just, this is the sound of the beacon I was talking about earlier that goes into the game. But here I'm using it for flavor for the OST version of the piece. And it's just, just a touch of, it's like very in the background. It's, it's, a, it's a minor detail that exists here. Now, I will take a detour before I go into the pads and the keys. Since we talked about the first core element the first foundational part of the piece. Let's talk about the second one, which is nested here in the miscellaneous section. And it's none other than this sample from Chanson de Tom. Now, if you know the original piece, you will probably think that this sounds familiar, but it doesn't sound exactly like the sample. In fact, what you're looking at and what you're listening to are quite different. There are a few effects that are applied here. Now, the three effects on the bottom, the vague clip is just a, a bit of soft uh, saturation. So once the, the, the signal cro starts crossing the threshold here, a little bit of drive is applied, just a little bit of crunch. There's the cassette, which is a quasi-cassette emulation actually let's let's just listen without it you can hear that with uh, the tape off the sound is much darker much beefier using the tape I've taken out a lot of low mid and low frequencies you might instinctively think that it sounds better with the tape off because it's, there's more meat to it but together with the synthesizers, together with the bass and the kick drum, it would just be an overwhelming amount of, you know, low end. So I didn't need that. I just needed the main qualities of the sound. So the tape adds a little bit of crunch and takes away this for my production needs. Again, this was all flavor. Then there's a micro shift. It adds a little bit like phasing effect. Let's listen with and without. This is almost inaudible, it's re because I'm using it very slightly. Essentially, it breaks away a little bit of my center to spread the sound just a little bit outwards because of the phase differences. 
And uh, this leaves a little bit more room for my bass and my uh, kick drum and my snare and all that stuff. But all of these are kind of details in shaping the sound. But the main thing that does the bulk of the work is this plugin. It's called Shaper Box. And in particular, this module here, the time module, because Shaper Box is a kind of a, a plugin where you can load different modules. It has a, a bunch of uh, modulation stuff called Shapers, hence Shaper Box. Pretty cool plugin where you can do really crazy stuff. But the time module is really fancy. So I'm gonna play the sample, the, the thing again, and pay attention on the curves here, or the lines rather. And now I'm going to turn it off and see how the thing sounds without it. Okay, so what happens here with Shaper Box is that when this line goes downwards, time is slowing down. So what this means is that when I use this particular downward slope, this angle, time is actually slowed down exactly by half. And this means that the things that would normally sound during this time slow down by half. And that means also that they are down by an octave because the slow down is doing by resampling. So it, it also affects the pitch. So half regular, half and uh, regular, and then this is actually twice as half. So two octaves down and twice half the speed, which is why when I have this off, we listen to the sample as it exists in the original uh, piece. And then when I bring this up, it's like that. The point is that this sample is manipulated to this degree to create this uh, type of effect and essentially this is used literally throughout the piece as you can see it's non-stop used throughout the piece and together with this synth here they make uh, as discussed earlier the foundation of the piece okay since we're talking about stuff that are from Chanson de Tom, I'll very quickly take a look at the clarinet sample. This is also a sample from the original piece. So this is used in uh, the late... Uh, I almost said the late game of the piece. Anyway, the last of the B part, essentially. So again, this is a flavory thing that I did to invoke the idea of uh, Chanson de Tom. So let's actually tuck this away and let's check out the pads. My pad. The pads. My pad. The pads. My pad. The pads. My body. The pads. My ride. The pads. My family. The pads. My church. Pads. My boy. Pads. My girl. Pads. My church. <laughs> As discussed, pads are like the slow moving stuff. I'm using three distinct pads. This is just the send effect that is used uh, in combination with this one. I'll talk about it in a minute. First one, the Solina. It's this plugin. It's an old school string emulation synthesizer. These were synthesizers that were supposed to sound like instruments. You know, we can have a, like a string orchestra in the studio at all times, so we'll have that to emulate it. But what's cool about these instruments is that they obviously they sound nothing like a string uh, orchestra. They're very quasi string, very paddy and stuff, but that's exactly why they became popular because they immediately took a very distinct role 
because of this sound that everybody knew that it was not a real string orchestra. And the reason why I'm using this one, I'm not using strings, I'm not using a modern string plugin which I could very easily use and it would give me a more you know, elaborate or more involved uh, string sound. And in fact, I'm actually using one here at the end. So let's take a listen to this one here. So you can see that this string pad is much closer to strings still not 100% realistic or anything but much closer than this one this completely sounds synthetic doesn't sound like a string orchestra at all but the reason I'm using it is exactly because I'm doing this homage to Prince and the the Prince era so to speak so this would be something that might be in one of the studios that he was recording and they could have used it to create a pad I don't want to make waste too much time on it. It's a very simple pad sound. It's added for flavor. That's all there is to it. It's doubled here by Native Instruments Massive, which is one of the synths that everybody has used at some point or other. This is another pad that I made sound something like this. If you listen, there's slight movement, slight movement on it. So that's the massive pad, but as I said, I'm sending into this cheap crusher and this is actually when things start to become a little bit more interesting about this pad. You can see here there's a volume automation and there's this chip crusher plugin, which is mixed in with the thing and pay attention as this comes in. So you can see in, in, it introduces this uh, kind of uh, crunch from the bit crush into the sound. It's very slight. I know I'm not not even sure it's gonna be audible here, but still, let's let's take a listen. As you can see, it's really, really subtle. It Again, it's another thing that introduces a bit of crunch and texture to the sound, which is something that I love very much. It's mostly hidden by all the things going on, but still, to me, in the overall production of, of the piece, it just adds a little bit to it, a little bit of taste, a little bit of character. And finally, the last pad here from my beloved CS80. It's used extensively in the soundtrack. It has a very, very distinct sound. And actually, you, you can see there's a lot of processing going on here. I'm gonna turn it off for a little bit. This is the pure sound. Don't, these are artifacts from stopping and starting the, the playback. This is not actually what's being played. And then I'll, I'll bring in the, the processing. So you can hear a lot of things. Crunch added to it, as usual. But the gating effect that it makes it into a stuttering instead of like a continuous pad. And of course, the panning left and right, which adds again width to the mix and takes it away from the middle to leave space for my kick and bass drum. So that was the pads. Let's move on to the keys. The piano, just really quick, is just it's just a piano. There's not much to it. There's a little bit of reverb added and stuff. But the only thing that it does, it adds this flavor brought in from the original Purple Rain song, this motive here. Which also, as I pointed out in the commentary, also happens to be the exact same uh, motive of, of Risk of Rain. Like a ta da ta da ta da ta da These four notes. A very happy coincidence taking place here. This is the Risk of Rain motive going up, and this is the Risk of Rain motive 
going down. So it was a nice serendipity. And it's used here on the half of the A part and then throughout going through the solo and into the outro. Here it starts to become a little bit rubato. Free. And here is where the crystallizer is also added to the mix. You see how the, the crystallizer uh, automation is being added here and you can start hearing there's more reverb going into it. You can hear this backwards uh, effect. Okay, so that's the piano. Not much to say about that. Then finally, we have the organ. I've used the organ a lot in this soundtrack. I was looking for an opportunity to use it because I really love the sound of the organ, the electric organ, and I got a few opportunities to use it in the soundtrack. But this appearance here is one of my favorites in the entire soundtrack. This, how it's used in the intro of this piece right here. As simple as it sounds, this screams to me organ. Just as simple as that, it has so much personality to it. The sound of the organ has so much personality. I'm actually doing something other than the MIDI automation. You might have noticed that uh, my rotary knob turns on and off and my pedal moves. Uh, you can see it here, it goes on. If you're not familiar with the, the rotary in the organ, it's literally a speaker that rotates, it slowly rotates. And when you turn it on, uh, switch it to fast rather, because there's actually a stop position. Uh, when you turn it on fast, it starts rotating faster and that gives the sound this tremolo effect. It's, it's a very cool effect. It's also used in other occasions. Uh, guitars have been amped through rotary speakers, uh, whatever, you can use it on whatever you want. But the cool thing about this being a two-scale organ, I'm actually taking advantage of that, and if you see these notes right here, when I select them in the info pane here, you can see that it says channel 2, and that's because I'm actually triggering the bottom keyboard. You see? And if I switch it on channel, oops, sorry, 1, I'm triggering the top keyboard, which is uh, a more involved sound, more aggressive sound, and it's used, for example, here. Or here. Etc. So, that's another cool thing that you can do with the organ. You can have two sounds, top and bottom, and also has the pedal on, on the bottom, which is like for... Uh, for, used for bass stuff, low-end stuff. Okay, so that's what's going on with that. Let's take a look at the... Hey everybody, sorry to interrupt the video. It's Chris, by the way. I have some really exciting news. This is my first sponsored video. We have a sponsor for the first time, and it's a narrative podcast. It's called Gospels of the Flood. On the day that the continents began to sink, I lost my faith in God. It wasn't a crisis of faith brought on by the terrible news. I did not raise my fist to the sky and curse God for abandoning mankind. It was simply an absence. The sudden realization that something wasn't there. Where faith had been in my heart, there was nothing. And I couldn't tell whether that was good or bad. It just was. Now, this is a podcast that I've listened to. It's, I'm sharing my own personal experience. I'm not reading from some copy here or whatever. It's uh, created by Jonas Kiradzis. He wrote and directed the story. It's an audio drama starring Peter Wingfield. He's an actor from Highlander, the series. It's an old show. And it's also sound and music by 
Christow Christo Christo Daulu. Chris 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 Christo Daulu. Okay. So they've done a pretty good job, I think, because I've listened to the show. There's a link for it in the Unexist trademark. But what you can do, simply just open any podcast app. Spotify, Apple uh, Podcasts, even Google Podcasts. You can search for Gospels of the Flood and you will find this podcast and you can listen to it there. It's seven episodes, 15 minutes each. I think it's a pretty good job. I would give these guys a chance. And I hear that they actually spend a lot of money on it and they haven't uh, made sure there's a way to monetize it beforehand. So that was pretty stupid. Anyway, they are sponsoring the video, which means they are spending even more money for sponsoring it. And I can tell you, I got a lot of money to, to read this, to, to share my experience of this show. So yeah, just give it a chance. Link in the Unexist trademark. And uh, that's it. Carry on with um, the video that you're watching. Leads. So when I say leads, I usually mean synthesizers that are not playing patterns. They are playing melodic arcs and or solos. So in this particular case, if I solo just all the leads, be careful. So these are playing stuff that are added to the whole sound, like background singers to the guitar solo. I don't want to spend too much time on them because I'm actually planning to do a separate video just on this classic Risk of Rain sound, which I'm doubling here. It's made with uh, the, the Omnisphere synthesizer. But the only thing I'm gonna say is that these two are essentially the same sound left and right. You can see it here. This is panned hard right, this is panned hard left. So they are again opening up and creating this effect that my mix is really wide. And then I have The Legend. It's an emulation of the Mini Moog. Very good emulation of the Mini Moog. I like it a lot. It even has a few additional features, but that's beyond this video right now. So I have made a pretty standard, let's say, Moog lead sound. A lot of delay, as you can hear. Since we talked about how I'm using my sense, this is an, an embedded, so to speak, delay sound, which is part of the design of the instrument. So here I have my delay. It's mixed in here. My reverb is quite wet. It's like almost 50-50. This is all because, again, these are background singers, so to speak, my choir that is accompanying the guitar solo. Just before I leave the leads and tuck them away, let's take a look at the, this here called the softest lead. This plays only in the outro, so. As you can hear, this is a very rounded uh, sound, it's very soft. While it's rich in harmonics, as you can see, they are quickly filtered that way so that uh, the sound is pretty soft, pretty tame. It has a little bit of portamento, so notes slide to each other instead of being like instantly going from one note to the other when there's a legato involved. It's again made using the open sphere. By the way, I don't want to go in depth on how these sounds are designed. It would just take us too much time. And I'll focus a little bit on the on the guitars, just I think there's enough interest there. But otherwise, it's just beyond the scope of this video. Speaking of three guitars. The Electric Prince, the Acoustic and the Electric Lead. Now, the Electric Prince starts off pretty chill, kind of like that. Let me bring in the amp. There's a little bit of like a little bit of reverb, some compression. 
Now this is where I design all of my guitar sounds, the, the electric guitar stuff. This is Amplitude, now it's actually on version 5, but uh, it wasn't released back when I was uh, recording Risk of Rain 2. It has a pretty standard guitar workflow in the sense that the signal path after the tuner, it goes in the stomps, so modulation and distortion and, and all the pedals and stuff, goes into the amp, it actually has an insert section, I think that's after version 4. The amp goes into the cabinet, which here you can adjust the position of the microphone, you can choose your cabinet, you can also change the room and you can mix all of the things together. And then finally you go from your microphone to your rack when you can apply further effects like compression, delays and what have you. So. This particular sound, which from this like funky kind of thingy it goes into this one, which is a very characteristic part of the piece. So I'm not going to too much detail about this particular sound and how it's made. There's a little bit of compression and overdrive and the amp is a Fender type amp. But what makes this sound really distinct is this envelope filter. I'm going to turn it off for a bit. So this is a pretty standard clean electric guitar. And with the filter on, you can hear this kind of wah effect, this wah, 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 you know? And this is a filter that reacts to the input signal. So you set your frequency and your resonance and your type of filter, which in my case is a classic low pass, so 12 uh, dB slope low pass. And then you set your depth depending on your input. So when I lower my depth, what essentially what's going to happen is that the, my filter is not going to open up as much. This will result in the sound being more muddled and more, you know, uh, wobbly, let's say. I'm not sure how to describe it, but you're going to hear it. To the degree that I'm, the depth is all the way down and the filter is literally not opening up at all. So essentially what you have is just a filter at this particular frequency, which is around 250 and with this particular resonance. So, well, now you hear that during the attack of the sound, the filter opens up and it has this wok, wok, wok. Okay, so that's how this sound is made. Then we have our acoustic guitar, which also comes in at the first time that this sound comes in. Now, something interesting about this acoustic guitar is, first of all, you might already say that it doesn't sound like an acoustic guitar, and that's true because I'm using this memory brigade delay as an insert here. And take a listen to the sound with and without the delay. So as you can hear, this is a classic acoustic guitar sound. If you pay attention, you can even hear the crackling of the wood from the microphone. And with the introduction of this delay, I'm using this kind of a, as an effect. So if you take a look here, I'm actually utilizing the chorus. Stereo width is set full out. This is kind of synced. As you see, they are set on the same uh, amount and they're actually on the eighth note, but there's an offset. So it means that not both of these eighth notes are gonna sound at exactly the same time. They're gonna have a slight uh, shift 
in timing. You might be thinking, I don't hear a delay here, I just hear a different sound. There's no like the characteristic of the delay. Now what's going on here is, if you actually check out the guitar, you will see that it actually starts an eighth note before the attack, before the bar, right? So let's take a listen from here without the effect. You see how it starts here? Let me... So the blend knob is all the way on full wet. So we're not listening to the dry signal at all. What we end up listening to is only the delayed signal. So because the delayed signal is an eighth later, I have moved my entire guitar track an eighth earlier, so this plays, it doesn't sound at all, and the delay unit kicks in right here. So listen to it. Now with the delay on, you will see that it will start here on the beat. Got it? Was that too complex? I don't know. Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm using this as a sound design tool. Okay, and now the, the lead guitar is the last thing that I want to show. So before I actually showcase it, let me just really quick play a little bit of the strings here in the outro. It's just a simple string patch on Omnisphere. It plays, it uses a pedal tone on the B flat and just straight chords. Now this idea for the outro comes from the original Purple Rain piece. It's just like a fragment of it that I've interpreted in a particular way. And finally there's the low end, which is another instance of the legend, the Moog synthesizer, and it literally just plays a big fat B flat, B flat, F and B flat, uh, B flat fifth chord, open fifth. And these automation lines, this MIDI CC data here drives the cutoff and the resonance. Until the point here where The piece ends, like that, so that's it, so now let's jump back to the guitar. So the lead guitar, let me just bring up the automation lines, you can see there's a lot of automation, I'm gonna take you through it. The guitar sound is made on Soldano emulation amplification. Why I chose the Soldano is because it's the only amp that goes to 11, so that makes like a huge difference in the sound, obviously. There's a little bit of delay and reverb going on, and actually let me just bring it here because before it was mixed down because of the automation, now you can see there's a little bit of reverb and delay, a little bit of compression, and here's the main part of the sound together with the amp. A little bit of compression. This overdrive pedal does a lot of the sound design. And then we have the Warmonator. This, what this pedal does is actually drives the sound an octave higher. So whatever I'm playing, it actually sounds an octave higher. And unless I'm mistaken, this one is actually on throughout the piece. It's like, like at 100% throughout the piece. I don't think it changes at any part. So at all times I'm actually playing lower. This is because at some points I want to get really high. You know that on my solos I like to drive stuff pretty high towards the end of the solo. It's also part of the sound design because if I have this on and I'm playing something like on a, a medium fret on a low string and it sounds an octave higher, it will sound different than actually playing it on that fret on a string above it. And then we have this fuzz wah, so it's a wah wah pedal you can actually see, okay, there's an interesting thing here. This automation line drives the pedal. 
So you can see that the, this pedal is moving together with these automation points. But if you notice on this little button here, this little uh, LED light, you actually see that it corresponds to this one. And now you can actually see it's on, but here it's off. So, okay, I know this is confusing and stuff, but hear me out. What I'm trying to say is, so let's follow through. This is the automation line, right? And when this point is up, like throughout here, then the wah is turned off and you will see uh, this light being off. When this one is here, down and here, and from here on throughout the solo, then the wah is turned on and whatever movement is shown above here, it's actually moving the wah like all the time, but when it's off, it's just irrelevant. So that's the thing I'm trying to say here, right? Okay, I hope this is uh, clearer. What actually happened is that I played my solo, I used my wah pedal, and then I decided that during the first part, I don't want it on. So pay attention to the sound, how it changes, from here to here when the pedal is active and it's actually doing a sweep from low frequencies to higher frequencies. If you're not familiar with a wah pedal, it's essentially a notch filter applied on top of the signal. So it kind of boosts a specific range of the signal and it creates this wah sweeping sound. Okay, so you, you have your signal playing and you have like a little peak on the frequency spectrum just, you know, moving around depending on when you move your pedal. So listen to the sound here and how it changes when the pedal is activated and it does a sweep. So you see what's going on there and you might have actually noticed that some of these clicks like the turning on and off are audible you can sort of hear the effect being turned on and i don't really mind because it's not audible within the whole uh mix you, you really cannot hear it in the in the entire mix etc etc the point is not to listen to the track here okay so the, the other automation lines i'll just go through them quickly because we already spent a lot of time this one is driving the pedal here so the level the amount of distortion is being driven by this automation line and obviously i should say these are not performance stuff. I played the wah and the solo, but I wasn't, you know, having another third hand moving a knob on the thing or using my mouse or whatever. This is done after the fact to bring the thing to my liking. You can see that I'm moving the distortion a little bit. And at some points, for example, these peaks here, I don't know if you can guess from listening to it just before, these are the parts where I play the harmonics. So that's why the distortion is brought all the way up to, to bring the harmonics out. So stuff like that, I try to pay attention to. And then finally, there's a little bit of manipulation on the mix of the delay. For example, here, listen to the solo and what it does and see why I'm boosting the delay effect. So if you hear as I'm doing that, you hear an answer, 
Na na na. What? This is why I'm boosting the delay just a little bit. The last thing that I should also point out is that the reverb parameter is being added. So that's a guitar sound and uh, that's pretty much the entire session. The only other noteworthy thing that I should say is the fade. I talked before about my buses and said how they all go into the submix. That's the case for almost every of my sessions but this one is just a little bit different. A lot of the channels, a lot of the buses and some individual channels are actually sent into this thing where they are treated into this big fade out and what happens here, let's zoom into this section, is First of all, you see the volume automation here, they're being faded away, so... You see how the fader follows this automation line? Another thing that happens is I'm using this plugin, it's called Proximity, and this emulates distance from a sound. So you kind of set some settings here, and as this fader goes down, it doesn't just take the volume down, but it also applies some EQing and some uh, other stuff and creates an effect that the, the signal is going away from you. There's also the automation of the dry and wet signal of this effect, which is intensity, this reverb from Arturia, which has a beautiful, beautiful lush sound. I really love it, but I'm kind of using it in a very exaggerated way here and I'm actually if you notice the the final automation line I'm gonna solo the fade so all of the stuff that go into the outro are not playing anymore only the stuff that are involved in this big fade out are playing but this automation here will trigger the freeze button and take a look at what the freeze button does So the freeze button does exactly what it says. It freezes the particular grain of the reverb at that time and just holds it on. And it, so you essentially pause your reverb. In the meantime, the outro stuff have kicked in. And so we have this crossfade into the outro. So that's really it. I think I've talked about pretty much everything. If this is interesting to you, you might want to check out the engineer edition that I have put out on my Bandcam. There's a link in the Unexist trademark, which is the entire album exported in stems. In other words, instead of getting the output of the master bus, you're getting the individual outputs of these buses here. It's a great way to digest what's going on in the music. If that's interesting, it's available there. So, at this point, I should say just thank you for watching. I hope you found that interesting. You can ask me anything you want in the comments about technical stuff, about musical stuff, whatever. I'll elaborate and if there is something that a lot of people want to know, I'll do a separate video about. And I want to remind you that please take a look at the Unexist trademark and check out Gospels of the Flood. It's available completely free. It's uh, seven 15 minute long episodes. You can binge it quite easily. Anyway, thank you all for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.